We're now going to take up the story in the second half of the 20th century, after the cognitive turn that we've discussed so much. Around this time, Noam Chomsky was completing his PhD work, and that became a very influential volume known as Syntactic Structures, which introduced the notion of transformational grammar, which became insanely popular. Um, two years later, in 59, he wrote a review of B.F. Skinner's book, which attempted to take the notions, the conceptual framework of behaviorism and address language in a book called Verbal Behavior. Chomsky's review was um, scathing, to put it mildly. Um, Chomsky's world was one of the computation and formal structure. His expertise lay in formal grammars, which are the kind of grammars that underlie, underlie uh, computing languages, not necessarily anything much to do with human languages. But he found that that mind frame could be brought to bear on syntactic structures, which became seen as part of the um, core of the human of human cognition. And he worked closely with a philosopher called Jerry Fodor, whose 1975 book, The Language of Thought, made cognition and language inseparable, using a Chomskyan frame to characterize what language is. So in this time, cognitivism, uh, the computational theory of mind, the application of the computer metaphor, and the illiberal and unbounded use of the term information becomes prevalent and begins to replace behaviorism as the dominant framework. In Skinner's book, he tried to characterize spoken language, not as a system, but as a set of behaviors uh, which were learned. So from, uh, regarding them more or less as habits, uh, suggesting that in becoming a language using human being, what you were doing was developing the habits that allowed you to engage in conversation. Chomsky ridiculed the notion I suspect that the ridicule to which this proposal has been held is perhaps overdone, but Chomsky had some very, very good points to make, and the view of human language behaviour as a set of habits doesn't stand up to any empirical test. Um, Chomsky noted, for example, that sentences are generated creatively, productively, there's no guarantee that any given sentence has ever been said before in the history of the human language. Uh, so that cannot really be explained in a framework in which such behaviours are understood as habits. Um, the Chomsky in turn and generative linguistics became the core of modern linguistics. Linguistics is a very, very broad area but this is, has been a dominant paradigm since the 50s and 60s. Um, at the heart of generative linguistics is the mathematical treatment of syntax, and we'll come to that. But syntax is about the rule-based um, development of structures in which symbols are uh, placed in a certain order. Um, that form of thinking about language made this compatible with a lot of the nascent and emerging theories within the discipline of cognitive psychology and, of course, the uh, set of metaphors and concepts that came out of the computerized turn. Noam Chomsky was very, very central to this, so we need to have a look at his particular program a little bit more. Um, Chomsky adopted a strongly rationalist perspective, which contrasts with the empiricism of the behaviorists. And in keeping with the themes of rationalism, um, he placed great emphasis on the capacities that an infant is born with, as if certain forms of understanding, certain um, tendencies to adopt and use particular structures came from our biology. On this basis, he argued that the language to which a child is exposed in the first few years of its life is itself not a sufficient evidentiary basis for learning to use language. 
This is known as the poverty of the stimulus argument, and it's a very, very important argument. It's a claim that the empirical data to which a, which a child encounters in its first few years is insufficient to ground language use. And a consequence of this claim is that um, we need to account for the rapid acquisition and proficiency of children in learning languages in some other way. So Chomsky suggested that because all humans in all cultures seem to have language and seem to bear the same capacity for quickly learning to interact using language, that they must all have a set of structures or sensitivities inbuilt. The term hardwired is often used, and I hate that term. It's not a useful term. It belongs on the trash heap along with instinct as meaningless concepts. Um, but the claim is that the biology of a newborn child predisposes them to learning languages such that the encounter with a specific language like English or Chinese then is merely filling in some details. So the universal grammar assumed to be the birthright of every human dictates the space of possible languages and language learning in an infant then is merely a selection among a much a highly constrained set of possible languages. And language here is given a particular interpretation which we are not bound to accept. The question is, can you make use of this characterization of language? There are many, many sides to language, language use, languaging that are not captured by this approach. But this approach has proved very, very fruitful in its characterization of language as a, an abstract faculty, as universal in nature. So the universal grammar is presumed to be the same for humans, much like we are born with opposable thumbs, we're born with the capacity to learn language. And in keeping with the um, insights of the structuralist tradition, uh, the structures of language are seen as being systematic. That means they it's possible to reason formally about them. They are well-defined objects which admit of formal reasoning. And this all fits with the intellectual context here of the 50s and 60s, in which the idea of that one might approach questions of mind by treating um, the brain as the hardware and cognition as the kind of software that runs on it, it suited that kind of discourse. And that may seem very modern given its turn uh, to the computer, but it's worth noting that this idea of Chomsky's of a universal grammar uh, reifies, that is, it makes a thing of language, excluding many, many phenomena you might want to discuss, including only very specific ones, making a well-defined special purpose domain, or what in, in, in older forms of psychology was called a psychological faculty. This creates a, a, a monolithic phenomenon, that is, there's a, um, it's almost as if there is a single organ or a, 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 an encapsulated system somewhere that um, is responsible for language and hence that is the driver for the whole of human culture and the shared human life world. So the claim is not so modern after all, the attribution of faculties to characterize whatever one thinks human minds or cognition are, is as old as psychology itself, the faculty of reason being perhaps the um, most often postulated faculty, one which one can definitely take exception to. Now, I mentioned that Chomsky's early work defined something called transformational grammar, and his work in particular um, changed over the years, and with each change, a whole new generation of linguists working within the revised framework was born. Transformational grammar um, was very influential in the 60s and 70s, but it became replaced in the 80s and 90s by a broader approach, a more minimalist approach, it must be said, called the principles and parameters approach. And since about 2000, this has become even more minimalist, trying to narrow down uh, the smallest possible set of distinctions, capacities, and structures that are needed in order to account for, for what is 
unique about human language use. And this gives rise to the notion of a faculty of language, there's faculty psychology again, narrowly conceived, reduced to an absolute minimum. Now, the, the ideas underlying transformational grammar have by and large gone away in the meantime. Transformational grammar um, recognized that we are capable of producing sequences of words that mean the same thing, even though the words are in a different order. So, for example, if we say Mary kissed John, we could also say John was kissed by Mary. Those are not entirely equivalent, but they do portray uh, a similar ordering of events in which Mary is the kisser and John is the kissee. The idea then of transformational grammar was that before uttering a sentence like this, the deep structure for both of these surface realizations would be the same. And one of the surface structures could be converted to the other through a, a, a rule-based process. So to give a, a clearer idea of this, here is the kind of way that a sentence is understood in transformational grammar. The sentence being, I suppose that someone says the sentence, she gives me a book. Now in that, there is she, there's me, there's the book, and there's giving. And those relations can be expressed in many ways. One of them is shown there. The idea being that this might correspond to something like the deep structure. She gives the book to me. Each word there is assigned a category. There's nouns, verbs, and prepositions and such like. And the words are grouped into phrases, like noun phrases, prepositional phrases, and so on. And all these phrases are grouped together under the heading of a sentence, S, at the top. This is known as a phrase structure. And transformational grammar provided means for taking such structures and reorganizing them. But as I said, although this appealed to a lot of people and it tied in with vaguely related notions in, in fields like psychoanalysis, um, it, as a formal mechanism, it wasn't pursued much beyond the 1980s, and it gave rise to a much more minimalist approach called the Principles and Parameters. Um, principles and Parameters approach assumes, uh, relies on the notion of universal grammar. Um, the basic starting point is that the data from a child's linguistic environment is not sufficient to support language learning. Uh, nonetheless, we the child will develop adult linguistic competence in the course of time. And principles and parameters uh, contrasts what we might call an empiricist and a rationalist approach. In the empiricist approach, it would suggest that their general purpose learning principles that allow you to learn all kinds of things might suffice also to learn language. And the rationalist or nativist, as it's expressed here, approach is much more particular. It says there's a language-specific cognitive endowment, the universal grammar, which operates together with domain general and language specific processing mechanisms to generate the adult linguistic competence. On this idea, then when a child is learning a language, it's not learning everything that one needs to learn about language. Rather, there are certain features that distinguish one language from another. A child obviously has to learn them, but that which the languages have in common, a child is already endowed with. Now that notion of what they have in common has got boiled down further and I said since about 2000 we have the idea of the faculty of language narrowly conceived. This has now been reduced to almost a single abstract notion of recursion. Recursion is a mathematical property. If you have um, something x, one part of which can also be described as x, then you have a nesting, um, which is called recursion. So if I have a sentence, John kicked the ball, for example, that could be described as a structure. It can also be described as a component of a larger sentence, such as I said, Noam Chomsky kicked, said that John kicked the ball. That's a longer sentence, and there's, within that sentence there are sub-sentences. Um, recursion has very interesting mathematical properties. It seems to be a property of human languages, which makes certain kinds of syntactic constructions uh, possible. In this respect, it differs from other forms of complex sequenced behaviors, such as the movements we do with our hands when typing, for example. 
Um, but what's important to note is that since the postulation of the faculty of language narrowly conceived, there's almost no empirical content left to this uh, approach to language. There's no, almost nothing you can go out in the world and find. Um, notice what's gone on here, though, as well. The, um, the theory has driven linguists of this school to a position where they seem to be asserting that what it is to be human is to be able to deal with recursion in this sense, that is to generate strings which have particular structures and as components of those there are structures which are isomorphic to an entire structure, sentences within sentences, phrases within phrases. That's a bold theoretical move and anyone who places lines around humanity like that is open to challenge. And um, since that, there has been at least one very heavily debated case of an apparent language that does not have recursion. This is a language of the Piraha, who live in the Amazon in Brazil. The guy in the water there is Dan Everett, who's a linguist who went out first as a missionary to try to convert these people. When they weren't interested in the missionary stuff, they converted him. Um, and he's now a linguist who uh, is engaged in a multi-year-long, very public and somewhat acrimonious battle with Chomsky and his followers, precisely because of the arrogance of the theoreticians from Boston, Chomsky et al., in trying to define the bounds of humanity. If you now find a language without a recursion, you've got two choices. You can either revise your theory, which is something nobody likes doing, or you can declare that this particular group of people that are not human, which is absolutely unacceptable. The debate rages on. Um, for those who, who have followed the progression from transformational grammar through principles and parameters up to the faculty of language narrowly conceived, there seems to be something very, very important here. Most of the rest of us have grown to have broader views of language, and linguistics is um, sufficiently ample to deal with a lot of different theoretical standpoints, views of what language is, and so on. What we'll do in the next video is we will look at language as it has been constructed within the generative tradition, for there's more to it than syntax. We'll look at the various sub-areas of language as understood within that tradition. Um, drawing some distinctions there. And later on, we'll move on to look at other views of language.